first. All right. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. All right. So today, for our Bible study, we're going to be talking about Matthew 14, 1 through 12. So there's a study guide within your guys' bulletins, or if you'd like to follow along with the Orthodox study Bibles that are in the pews, please. So usually I like starting off with a story, and one is, and you'll see it, it's called, it was funny, when I was thinking about the passage and how I was going to really tie in a story to it, I thought of, all I could think about was this one story, and it's called The Young, The Restless, General Hospital, and One Life to Live. So when I was growing up, I had, my parents were immigrants from Greece, and they had come, so most of the time they had to work, as most of us know how that works, you know, they had to work a lot to feed the family and so on. So me and my sisters were mostly taken care of by our grandmothers. So, of course, along with that comes daytime television, and I remember sitting there watching One Life to Live, General Hospital, and I mean, yes, all of them, every single one of them. So these soap operas that happened during the daytime. And I keep thinking to myself, I would, I would go in and out, in and out, and be like, who is this guy? Like, who's Sonny? Like, this guy died five episodes beforehand. Now it's his evil Now it's, you know, why is she smacking him? Why is everyone angry? No one knows what's going on. And I have a confession to make. When I first started studying the Bible at the seminary, and even before then, I had that same type of confusion. The confusion of, who are these guys? Who is actually being spoken about in the Bible? Sometimes they're in parables. Sometimes you see people with the same name. You think, okay, it says John. Now, is this John the Baptist? Is this John the Evangelist? Who knows? Nobody knows. But then you have to read deeper into the story. So today, we're going to be reading about two really main people. So if you can, open up your Bibles. We're going to read out Matthew 14, 1 through 12. And I'll read it aloud, and then you guys can follow along. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. So today, in this passage, we are now hearing about two main characters. We're hearing about Herod, and we're hearing about St. John the Baptist. So Herod is, was given a position called the Tetrarch. Generally known, he was known as Herod the Tetrarch or Herod Antipas. Caesar, Augustus of Rome, ratified this position when his father, Herod the Great, again, Herod, died in 4 BC. His kingdom was then divided into four parts, and he was the one that was governing these four parts. But within them, he had his brothers, his stepbrothers, all governing with him along. So, as I just saw, everyone kind of hearing that there's two Herods, multiple Herods, it gets confusing because some people were thinking when I first read the passage, okay, this might be Herod the Great, who lived when Jesus lived and was ruling this area that was divided into four parts, but it's not necessarily Herod who's the one that baptized that baptized, beheaded, sorry, beheaded St. John the Baptist. So as you'll see in your study guides, there are actually a couple Herods that are within the Bible. And the first one is his father, who was Herod the Great, who ruled when Jesus was born. And you can see that in Matthew 2, 1 through 19. There's Herod Agrippa, his nephew, who killed James, 
the Apostle James, in Acts 12, 1 through 2. Then there's Herod Agrippa II, his grandnephew, who before Paul appeared in Acts. So Herod's the one that's in the story. His accomplishments as a tetrarch, he governed Galilee and Berea for 42 years. That was his main, of the four parts, that was his main one that he was overseeing. And he built the cities of Sephorus, Tiberias, and oversaw many projects within those cities. Um, he is mostly known for imprisoning St. John the Baptist and beheading him. And also, he later then, on to the, in the gospel, he later mocked Jesus prior to his death, which led to his friendship with Pilate. Herod, the Tetrarch, the one that we're talking about today, had the potential to be a very, very, very good person. But the power of what we call the power seat, being in that power seat, having that power really got to him. He believed that something was special about John. He respected that. He saw them and people around him in the cities saw him, John the Baptist, as a prophet, as a holy man, a just man. And for that, that is why he respected him. So he knew what was good about John and could have emulated that. He could have been St. John the Baptist. He could have been just like him, had him followed the rules just like him, followed the law just like him. But instead, he feared those who had power around him. When we hear in the story, he was celebrating his birthday and he invited you know, all the powerful people. It was a huge gathering. And right in front of them all, he was asked to behead John the Baptist. He necessarily didn't want to do that. But the power of everyone around him, what would they thought if he made an oath to Herodias saying, I will do anything for you, name it. And she named it, but didn't give it up to him. He wouldn't be following his promise. So it would make him seem weak to everyone around him. So think about how he was so easily manipulated because of this power that he had to steer him in the wrong direction. Now we're going to talk about St. John the Baptist. He's the second main person in the story, the one that was beheaded by Herod. His message was a call to lead everyone to repentance. He did not back away from pointing out the sins of the king. He said in the story, if you remember, he said, you are having an unlawful, an unlawful marriage because that's, Philip, that's Philip's wife. That's your brother's wife. That's adultery. You are having an unlawful marriage. Now think about it. Would you go up to the president, for example, and be like, hey, you're having an unlawful marriage? No. More than likely, Secret Services can come after you and probably tackle you. But in this case, he was already in prison for the sake of saying this. And he says it again. And make sure that Herod knows that what he is doing is wrong. He stood up to the king for the sanctity of marriage. His faithfulness should actually inspire us today to be true to God's word, the faithfulness that we see with St. John the Baptist. Even when not being politically correct, we should still be able to stick to our guns and be able to say, you want to know what? This is not what I truly believe. You know, I've read these. I follow the Ten Commandments. Sometimes society will steer us in a whole different way where it just makes things seem normal, that it's okay that, you know, for example, we were at a retreat yesterday and I was sitting at a table with Father Chris, Father John, uh, Father Spiro down in Miami, Father Aristides, and we were sitting there and we were actually just talking about television. And I remember Father Chris being like, oh, now I have 2,200 channels and I have no idea what to do with it. I only watch the news. And then Father Spiro goes, well, you're not missing anything. And we kept going and he started talking about shows called like Naked and Afraid, Naked Dating, that are completely out there and against the norm of what we believe as Orthodox Christians. Naked dating. Like, like I, I'm just going to throw it out there. Like, I don't think I have to say much about that, but it exists. And this is what is, society is making, a normal, is making it normal for these things to occur. But this is going against the sanctity of what marriage and what we believe as Christians. So if St. John the Baptist was here, he would be like, oh my God, this is totally not right. This is unlawful to whoever because he did not have that fear. 
he was not easily manipulated. When you think about the two people now, think about what really made them different. You know, they both had a sense of power. St. John the Baptist had followers. There's people there. You can even see in the baptism of Christ, you have, there's people all around. Herod, he was the king. He was in that power seat. He had political followers. He had the police, they had people that really believed in what Herod was doing was completely right. So think about this difference. The story in the Bible is called Herod's Fear. They gave a little subtitle on it, Herod's Fear. And it's truly what separates them. is not just the names, and it's not the power. They both had authority, but it's the fear. It's the fear of that power. If we had the fear of Herod, what would, what would we do? We all have a power seat as well. Some of us are parents. Some of us are businessmen or women. Some of us are just in a power seat where other people come to us. Now, are we going to go along with what society tells us, with what you know, might be the wrong answer? No. We're going to have that... Sorry, I'm not used to this. <laughs> We're going to have that sense of, okay, how can I be like St. John the Baptist? How can I be better as a person and overcome this fear of being in that power seat when people come to us? So as you see on your study guides, I wrote, I didn't write, I had copied and pasted a poem that was written by Marianne Williamson that I remember watching as a child, a, a movie called Coach Carter, and it really stuck with me, and that's where I first heard it, knowing that it came from miles ago. But I wanted to share that with you because when I really read this passage, the first thing I thought was, the fear is the difference between being Herod and being St. John the Baptist. That is what separates these two men. And this quotation about fear and how we can overcome it really emulates what we can learn from this passage. So I'm going to read it along, and you guys can read it on the study guides as well, and you'll have it with you. So the quote weeds. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is not our light, not our darkness that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. You are all meant to shine, as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us. It is in all of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give it to other people and permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Couldn't say it any better at all. This quotation really puts into perspective how fear affects us as Orthodox Christians. And it affects our potential to be great for the glory of God. So this coming week and the coming weeks, I challenge you, overcome some type of fear that makes you think that you know, if I could overcome this, it will make me better on the inside. It will make me a better person. And that's the challenge that I'm going to leave you all with. So we're going to continue with liturgy. And if you'd like to talk about more about the passage, I will be here, as always. And so thank you all very much. <laughs>